Good morning, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us for this very special celebration of the 2021 International Day of Women and Girls in Science. I'm Katriona Nguyen-Robertson, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm delighted to be your MC today. This event is being delivered by the Commissioner for Environmental Sustainability Victoria in partnership with the Royal Society of Victoria. The Commissioner for Environmental Sustainability, Victoria's Chief Environmental Scientist, and Victoria's lead scientist have collaborated over many years to celebrate this day with school students and this year is no different. Before we go any further we would first like to recognize and pay respect to the traditional owners of the land and their elders past, present and emerging. We celebrate the over 60,000 years of custodianship of Victoria's environment. First Nations people were this land's first scientists in their endeavor to understand and explore the earth, sky and sea. We look forward to sharing a very different future together. I'm currently on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations and I invite you to think about whose country you are on. It's great that we have so many of you from across Victoria on different lands. It's amazing, thanks for tuning in. Today, we are joined by some incredible female scientists we welcome Victoria's leaders in STEM, Dr. Gillian Sparks, the Commissioner for Environmental Sustainability, Dr. Amanda Caples, Victoria's lead scientist, and Dr. Andrea Hinwood, Victoria's chief environmental scientist. We also have Dr. Manira Banno, Associate Professor Misty Jenkins, and Dr. Amy Kitsey joining us today. Finally, a big welcome to everyone who is live streaming this event in schools from around Victoria. You can follow what's happening around the world today with the hashtag Women in Science for SDGs or Sustainable Development Goals, which is on the screen. The International Day of Women and Girls in Science was first announced by the United Nations General Assembly in 2015, and it is now celebrated on the 11th of February every year around the world. This day is about crushing stereotypes and celebrating leaders and inspiring role models in, scientists, in science who were women and supporting the next generation of scientists, you. Collaborative events such as this one provide inspiration. I know I'm certainly in awe of all the speakers and panelists that we have lined up. These events also provide opportunities to you, the young women of today and the future to get further education, follow career paths that you're passionate about, and ultimately make a difference to society and the world. When you think of a scientist, who comes to your mind? Do you think of Albert Einstein, one of the guys from the Big Bang Theory, a female scientist? Do you see yourself? There is no right or wrong answer, and every child is a scientist, curious about the world, asking how, what, where, why? There are successful scientists who are people of color, non-binary, genderqueer, or who live with a disability. And I myself, I'm an Asian queer female singing scientist. Women have contributed to major advances in science. For example, Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier's groundbreaking work in gene editing won them the 2020 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Their win marked the first time a science-related Nobel Prize was shared by women and no men. With this, 2020 became only the second year in which science prizes were awarded to more than one woman. One good thing to come out of 2020. <laughs> but speaking of, the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic clearly demonstrated the critical role of women researchers in different stages of the fight against COVID-19. Leading researchers were helping to advance our knowledge of the virus, develop techniques for testing and create vaccines against the virus. There were also an extraordinary number of women on the front lines in terms of public health and policy, involved in testing, patient care, and ultimately ensuring that we all stay safe. This year's theme for the International Day of Women and Girls in Science reflects the incredible efforts of women around the world on the COVID-19 front lines. In addition, all around Australia, there are remarkable women in science investigating dark matter and exploring the universe, discovering new species, developing disease treatments, designing better solar panels, and understanding the latest technology, nanotechnology and precision medicine. And there are also remarkable women who develop health and science policies, administer research grants, commercialize prototypes, and teach the next generation of scientists. 
I'm an immunology researcher at the Peter Doherty Institute for Infection and Immunity, where I've seen firsthand the incredible work done by female researchers and clinicians. I'm also a science communications officer for the Royal Society of Victoria, and I teach and write songs about science on a ukulele and piano. I never saw anyone doing it before me, so you can definitely pave your own way and mix your passions together like I have with science and music. I've always looked for role models and mentors in the science world, and some great role models are our inspiring speakers, Dr. Manira Bano, Associate Professor Misty Jenkins, and Dr. Amy Kitsey. You will hear about their education, careers and accomplishments, but also the challenges that they face. They are people, just like you and me after all. They'll share their journeys with you to inspire you to be visible and not hidden figures. I'd first like to introduce Dr. Manira Bano, a senior lecturer of software engineering at Deakin University. She graduated from the University of Technology, Sydney in 2015 with a PhD in software engineering. She was a superstar of STEM and named the most influential Asian Australian under 40 in 2019 and is one of my personal role models. Over to you, Manira. Thank you so much, Katriona. So hello everyone, I'm Dr. Munira Banu and uh, I'm so excited to be here today talking to all of you on International Days for Women and Girls in Science. And uh, it's an honor to be next to such a stellar group of uh, female scientists across different fields of STEM. So I'm just like Katrina mentioned, I'm a senior lecturer for uh, of software engineering at Deakin University, and I'm one of the superstars of STEM for Science and Technology Australia. I was the ambassador for Go Girl Go for IT in 2020, and I am also an honorary adjunct at the Requirements Engineering Lab at University of Technology, Sydney. So before I can talk about myself or share uh, my story of how I ended up exactly where I am today, I would like to share a story of another very remarkable woman from history, Ada. Ada Lovelace uh, had a brief life on this earth, but during those limited number of years, she managed to earn herself the title of being the first computer programmer. Yes. So when I was studying software engineering and computer science, I didn't know this fact. And I hope that today all of you know that would know from this point onward that she is attributed to be the first computer programmer. Uh, and also the very fact that departments of defense in USA have named a very, uh, a very specific programming language after her. And every year in October, there's a day that is celebrated to highlight the very fact that history often overlooked the achievements and the contributions that the women have made to the field of mathematics and uh, the field of computing. Uh, a little bit more about her, that she was born into uh, aristocracy and was the daughter of Lord Byron, who was a romantic poet. And I think our MC Catriona would be really pleased to know that uh, she was not just the first computer scientist, but also a poet as well. And her father, who was expecting a glorious boy for the family lineage, was a bit disappointed when she was born, that it's a baby girl. And only when she was one month old, left both her mother and England forever. And her mother, in her attempt to sway her away from arts and poet, uh, poetry, pushed her towards mathematics and science. But she had a really great imagination that she inherited from her father. And not only she had the way of imagining things, but also she learned the mathematics and science and a great combination that eventually led her to become one of the visionaries who was so ahead of her time that the people in her time thought that she was scary. And even her mother thought that her ideas were very crazy. So. At that time, when Edda Ed was uh, uh, following her pursuit and passion for science, Royal Society of England would not accept contributions from women. So her, uh, she became lucky when she found Charles Babbage, another computer scientist who was so impressed with her intelligence that he became her mentor and did uh, promote her to other scientists. 
So he was working at that time on one of uh, his uh, mechanical machines called an elliptical engine, but it was Ada who provided the intellectual interpretation of these machines, uh, its states and its outputs. She published her work in 1843. And after 200 years now, we see that the way she looked at the computer with the visions that she provided, now we understand them, that she was laying the foundation for the modern computer work. So she referred to herself as an analyst and her approach as poetical science. This is why uh, I think she was very amazing in a sense that her combination of arts and science provided a vision that was so ahead of her time. And she looked at individuals and peoples uh, and technology as a collaborative tool. Today, we, our lives are so dependent on technology, simple act of waking up in the morning, looking at our mobiles, ordering a ride uh, and uh, using Uber. Even right now, we are connected through a Zoom. So all this computer technology, how society and people interact, she saw that vision 200 years ago. Now, how do I relate to Ada? I was born in Pakistan uh, in a Pashtun ethnicity, which, uh, is, uh, which is geographically located in the northwest of country where next to the border of Afghanistan. Most of you would know Malala Yousafzai. So she's from that part of the world. My mother was not allowed access to education. I was lucky to be born in the capital where I was given the privilege uh, and equal access to education, just like my brothers. But growing up, I never had any female role models to look up to how to navigate uh, in the field, which is a male dominated field of science and then later on became computing, how to make choices about my career or education. So I had to figure out things on my own, but I moved into these hard sciences and male dominated fields to prove a point that when you are given an opportunity, your intelligence is not dependent on the norms of the society. Uh, it's not dependent on how you are being perceived or what the society wants you to be. You can achieve, it's difficult, but it's possible. And then I did break through the social and cultural barriers the day when I received my PhD in software engineering from UTS. And I am the only woman in my entire family to have a doctorate in software engineering. But la my passion didn't stop there. I have moved forward into more of those domi male dominated fields and futuristic technologies with the aim that my teaching and research will focus to design those technologies to build an inclusive and fair future for people regardless of their gender, race, and ethnicity. Things need to change and we have to contribute our part to it. During pandemic, we all saw that technology was there to sustain the society. The education, the small businesses, the, some of the functions of the government, they all were moving the way they should have because of the engineers and the computer scientists who provided the vision of internet of connectivity. Imagine, just imagine for one minute, if you, we didn't have internet during the pandemic, how things would have worked out, how isolated we would have been. So just like Edda saw a vision long ago that how people and technology will be collaborative too, we need to, at the same time, ensure that this tool is fair and inclusive to all people in the future. So today uh, on this International Day for Women and Girls in Science, my message is very simple. Education is a privilege and STEM education is empowerment. I am the living proof of that. I have seen it that millions of girls out there are still today denied this basic, what we think something we take for granted, they are denied of this privilege. Never take it for granted and follow your basic instincts. The passion of the science will find its way, just like for Edda, Maybe she was not appreciated 200 years ago, but now we know she was the genius woman and the first computer scientist. Thank you so much for your talk, and I will get it back to Katriana. Thank you, Minera, for sharing your story and for sharing Ada's story. Um, certainly, we appreciate you. <laughs> I would now like to introduce Associate Professor Misty Jenkins. 
Misty leads her own immunotherapy lab, developing ways to fight cancer at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute. She was the first Indigenous Australian to attend Oxford and Cambridge Universities as a postdoctoral research fellow. And as an immunology researcher myself, Misty is a great role model and mentor to me. Over to you, Misty. Thanks, Katrina, for that introduction. And I also want to acknowledge the um, owners of the land. I'm streaming to you today um, on uh, land traditionally owned by the Wurundjeri and the Boon Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation who've cared for this beautiful land for many thousands of years. So I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, what I wanted to talk to you about today was really just the takeaway message is that you are all little scientists already, you know, that science is all around you. And if we close our eyes and imagine a world without science, you know, no medicine when you're sick, people dying from disease, no technology, electricity, as Minera outlined, no internet, um, it would be a very different sort of place. And I think the more we learn, the more we realise um, that we don't know. Um, the, the thing about science is that it is all around us. As Katrina sort of pointed out, you're already little scientists now. Um, just as in this picture, this is a picture of my daughter in our garden with her binoculars looking and observing the bird life. Um, I spend my days looking down microscopes and ob observing cells and the behaviour of cells. And that tells us something about their behaviour. And in fact, just by doing this, I've made observations and discovered things that have ended up in textbooks in, in your schools. So um, you never know where it's going to lead. My journey began at the local government school just on the outskirts of Ballarat. I never knew anyone who'd been to university. It seemed very out of reach to me. Um, when I was 11, I joined St John Ambulance and started learning about the body and that really did ignite a spark in me that was really yet to be sated. I got lots of throat infections as a teenager and I'd have these lumpy nodes in my neck come up and I'd say to my, oh, I've got tonsillitis again, what's going on in there? And it wasn't a question she could answer because like many of her generation, they left school at 14 and 15. But that's really a question that still drives me today. What's going on in there? How are those cells talking to each other? How are they mounting that army and that response to, to, you know, to get rid of those wayward invaders that try to attack our bodies every day? I was fascinated by the immune system. Um, and so I came to Melbourne Uni and did a an undergraduate um, science degree and then honours and, and then eventually a PhD. And this was really the time that just exploded. Um, it, ex it was an explosion of learning and possibility. And I think um, it was here that I truly understood the value of learning and education. I think I sort of hadn't really appreciated it so much at high school, but certainly when I was um, at high school, I did never thought for a second that I'd end up running my own lab and making discoveries um, and being a scientist. And I'm giving my age away now, but when I finished high school was 1996. And this was designated um, year of the vaccine to commemorate Edward Jenner's um, smallpox vaccine. And he was a medical student, actually. And he noticed that the milkmaids who contracted a disease called cowpox caused blistering on the cows. Others, but they didn't, the milkmaids and milking the cows didn't catch smallpox. But they had these um, skin eruptions on their hands from milking the cows. And so... Um, he thought that that was protecting them from the smallpox epidemic. And this was a very simple observation that led to the hypothesis, um, you know, that cowpox was protecting uh, from smallpox. And so to test this hypothesis, he took some fluid and pus from an eight-year-old boy, James Phipps, um, who actually was a, a servant's son, who um, he fed to him and was subsequently, he was protected from smallpox. And that essentially became the world's first vaccine, which of course was a huge success. Um, and caused a drastic uh, decline in the disease. And was that was a really a light bulb moment for me. Not only would you not get human ethics to do an experiment like that these days, which is a good thing, <laughs> but, you know, that really that, again, science is all around us. It was just about making an observation, um, coming up with a theory around that, and then designing a simple experiment to test that theory, uh, which completely changed the world and changed how we thought about infectious disease. Um, it, it wasn't magic. It was systematic. Um, and, I, and I loved that. I loved that way of thinking and that approach. So um, after I uh, finished my my, educa my postgraduate education, I went to Oxford and Cambridge um, to do a postdoc. And suddenly, I was mixing with philosophers and historians and Nobel laureates and even royalty. Prince Philip would come for tea, and debated theology with the Archbishop of Canterbury. That's the guy that married Kate and Wills. And you know, all of a sudden, I thought, "Geez, there's this girl from the bush." You know mixing with all of these incredible people so my education you know doing science gave me opportunities that money couldn't buy you know you can't buy opportunities like that and um and I 
I truly believe that a bright and innovative future for Australia lies within a community of diverse individuals working cross-culturally, intergenerationally, bridging those socioeconomic divides. And you're going to hear from a really great, you know, cross range of amazing women here today. Um, and I think that the best way to advance our society is to have as many people as possible from all different backgrounds, viewing the world through different a diverse lens. And certainly where I came from gave me that lens. Um, my mum's Aboriginal and um, I've been involved in a lot of um, in Indigenous education and health. And when I was in Cambridge, then that gave me an opportunity to establish scholarships for in Indigenous students. And now there's been over 63 postgraduate um, Aboriginal students graduate. And that's one of the things in my career that I'm actually most proud of. But I work in, um, so I forgot to change the slide, I'm just gabbing away here. Um, so I, I work in, my entire academic career, I've become a world specialist in the T cell. Now the T cell, these are little white blood cells that zoom around your body right now and your blood and your tissues and your lymph. And this is a picture of them zooming around. And when they find their enemy, and what's their enemy? It's a virus infected cell or a cancer cell. This orange T cell you can see on your screen now attacks and this is a blue cancer cell and attacks it and delivers the essentially the kiss of death and makes it blow up and I've been studying this process for many years now and trying to understand how we can harness this in the fight against cancer so here's a beautiful green T cell here delivering its bullets that essentially throws grenades at the enemy and makes it blow up sorry for all the war references but it's a really nice analogy for T cell killing and so um and so my entire career I've been working on these little cells and of course if we, we can now harness these in the therapy against disease and one t-cell killing one target doesn't make for a very efficient immune response but no thankfully they're serial killers so you've got this one little t-cell coming in here from the bottom of the screen and quickly going bang 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 and taking out this entire screen of cancer cells so this is what's happening in our bodies all the time when our immune system is working really well and so the really, you know, the, the really tricky thing about cancer is that just a few genetic changes in the cancer can make the difference um, between a healthy cell and a cancerous cell. And so how do you know? So how do we design drugs and treatments? And of course, well, we haven't done that very well. You know, radiation and chemotherapy, um, whilst advancing, you know, thera therapeutic uh, th therapies a lot, uh, also kill healthy cells. It's why you get sick. It's why you lose your hair. Your immune system has evolved really specific ways to be able to distinguish a healthy cell from a diseased cell. So immunotherapy has now become the fourth pillar of cancer research. So we can take a, a T cell, make it into a Mr. T cell, right? Like an absolute powerhouse that can come in and specifically recognize your cancer and selectively kill it and take it out. So it's really, really cool stuff. And so my lab um, has now applied this whole technique to look at brain cancer because brain cancer uh, kills more children than any other disease, full stop. Just, just let that sink in for a minute more kids get leukemia more kids die of brain cancer it's an incredibly um awful awful disease and particularly this one that i work on where these little kitties get brain tumors in their brain stem and their brain stem controls your breathing and your swallowing so you can't chop it out you can't have surgery and remove it um it's it doesn't respond to radio and chemotherapy so you know, you, we need new options. And so that's what we're looking at is how can we use the immune system and get those little T cell soldiers to recognize these tumors and kill them specifically. So that's what that's what I do in my day to day now. Um, but I think that um, that there's so not only is immunotherapy, of course, you know, a really great um, super weapon in the fight against cancer. I think there's to solve complex problems like brain cancer, we need diverse teams, as I said, we need interdisciplinary teams. And when we look back at some of the greatest scientific discoveries, They've come from um, having teams with a really mix of um, backgrounds. And so, you know, the fundamental questions that I get to ask on a day to day basis require working with biologists, computational programmers, geneticists, engineers, clinicians. Without all this diversity of experience, we can't understand the basic building blocks and go through to and take things through to the clinic. Um, so, of course, what's the big super, women, super weapon in the fight against cancer? It's women. We need more women at the table. We need more women in leadership. We need more women to think creatively outside the box and come and to be able to be here and contribute to this um, incredible research. And we need to be investing in medical research, um, which is why I think it's, you know, really critical to have a good awareness of what that means and what it's all about. And I think we've really seen that really well this year with COVID, right? So, you know, in 2020, my goodness, the whole world has had to really 
learn, you know, how to appreciate and have an awareness of the importance of medical research. These vaccines haven't been made and rushed and, and made very quickly. It's built on the last 20 years of investment um, and, and research. So they haven't just come out of overnight. We've had the capacity, we've had the people, we've had the infrastructure, we've had the buildings and the labs and everything set up ready to go. And so, um, let me just change. So I think that, you know, we're, we're now, you, you guys are all in such an amazing time in your life because you're really seeing this play out in a very real sense, you know, and you would have really felt the effects of COVID last year and the homeschooling. And I think it's just so important to really kind of tune into that science way of thinking, you know, that science is just a way of thinking. It's just about being rational. It's about thinking about facts. You know, as we're seeing in the media now, media outlets firing their science editors, we're seeing the decline of the expert, the rise of the citizen journalist, lots of quackery online. Just go to Google and type in can secure and you'll find a plethora, you know, of snake oil salesmen. And so um, huge challenge we face as a nation, you know, and it's one that's really can stifle innovation and discovery. So the best thing you guys can do right now is to learn how to learn you know, to that scientific methods will teach you how to distinguish a reputable source from a quack and just made up stuff that you read online. And the best part about science is you don't need to go to a fancy, expensive school to be a scientist. Science is the ultimate meritocracy. It's focus and ability that counts. It's not money and connections. So whoever you are, wherever you're from, you can absolutely be a scientist. And my experience as a scientist in, in, in summary has... Um, really allowed me to be involved in, in, you know, in lots of other things. So finding therapies for brain cancer, curing brain cancer in mice, which we are now, and planning a clinical trial right through to, um, you know, to working in, the pol in, in policy and, and being able to work with, you know, other incredible um, leaders in the state of Victoria. So my vision for the future is that all of you just learn how to learn, you know, take advantage of the fact that you have access to information like never before. You know, we didn't have Wikipedia in our pocket when, we were, when I was in high school. There's more, there's more um, you know, there's a more uh, advanced technology in this iPhone than there is in a nuclear reactor. This is an incredible time to be, you know, going through high school and to be making these choices about what you want to do. And technology and science is definitely the way of the future. So thanks so much. I just applaud you all for being here and tuning in and listening to this amazing day. And I can't wait to hear your stories uh, in the years to come. Thanks. Thanks, Misty. Your videos of T-cells killing cancer cells are absolutely stunning. And I hope we can see these Mr. T-cells in the clinic fighting brain cancers soon. Me too. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Amy Kurtzie is our final speaker for this section of the event. Have you ever thought about researching a thing as random as octopus saliva? Well, meet someone who has. After having studied this unlikely topic for her Bachelor of Zoology with honours, Amy undertook a PhD on the reintroduction biology of the Eastern Barred Bandicoot, which is a species classified as extinct in the wild. Today, Amy is a threatened species biologist at Zoos Victoria. Please welcome Amy. Um, so I'm really excited to be here today talking to you all. Um, I am a threatened species biologist at Zoos Victoria and it's without a doubt my dream job. It, it's a job that I absolutely adore, but it's one that took me 17 years to get. Um, and there were many, many times throughout that, that, those years that I thought that I would never work in conservation. So my career journey began back in the UK. I grew up in a very small town in the northwest of England called Wigan. This is a town that was built on coal mining. So this was in the industrial northwest of, of England. And growing up, I didn't know anybody that worked in the STEM sector. And I certainly didn't know anybody that had ever been to university. I was the first one in my family that, that did so. But from a very young age, I had a love of the environment and wildlife. And I think that began really with my grandma. She used to take me and my sister out on crazy adventures at the weekends. And usually there'd be some mishap, you know, someone would fall in the water or get stuck in the mud. Or there was a one time we got chased by an emu. Um, so she was the one that really connected me to the natural world and the environment. And then it was my dad that introduced me to David Attenborough documentaries and that opened my eyes to a whole world of, of animals across the planet you know this is the time before internet so that was my connection to different animals around the world 
So I knew from the age of about 13 that I wanted to work in conservation. And when I finished school and, well, in the UK back then, you finish school at 16 and then you go on if you want to to do year 11 and 12. And that's what I did. And I studied biology, environmental science and, and chemistry. And my environmental science teacher told me that um, I was wasting my time pursuing a career in conservation because I would never succeed. Now, I didn't listen to her and I'm glad I didn't. And I'm really glad that I had a very supportive mum who encouraged me to follow my dreams because her one regret in life was that she never followed her career aspirations. So I was still determined to work in conservation, but my dreams um, nearly came to an end when I got my final exam results. I did really well in biology and environmental science, but chemistry, not, not so good. I, I got an E. I never before in my entire life had I done so badly in an exam. And I was devastated because this meant I couldn't get into my first, second, or even third choice university. But it turned out to be a blessing in disguise because I did get a place at university. I went to Aberdeen and it was an absolutely fabulous you need to go to and that's where I did my honours there not on a conservation project but on octopus saliva of all things so when I finished my degree I, I came to Australia and I came here as a backpacker and I fell in love with the place I'd always been fascinated with Australian wildlife and, and I, once I got my residency here I started to look for a PhD and it took me a while and, and whilst I was looking for one, I started to work in a pathology lab and, and my main role was to prepare human saliva. There's a very strong saliva theme throughout my career journey. Um, it wasn't a particularly exciting job to do or a great smelling one, but um, it paid the bills. And when I started my PhD at Melbourne University on Eastern by Bandicoots, I was only part time. My grades, again, weren't good enough to get a scholarship. So I was part time for a couple of years. So I was really grateful to have that, that job in the pathology lab. So now I'm going to, I can't talk about bandicoots without showing you a picture of one. Um, hopefully I can figure out how to get one up. There we go. That is an Eastern fried bandicoot and they are known as extinct in the wild on mainland Victoria. And and that's mostly because almost all of the natural habitat has been lost. It's mostly converted to, to farmland. But the biggest threat that these guys face is predation by the introduced red fox. Now, when I started working with Eastern Bride Bandicoot 16 years ago, there was probably only around 100 of them left. Now, the numbers are increasing and they may well be the first mammal to be removed from the threatened species list in Victoria, which is really exciting. And part of the reason why is because they do possess some superpowers. So they have the second shortest gestation of any mammal at just 12 and a half days. They, they can breed throughout the year, so they don't have a set breeding season. And they start breeding from three months old, so they can really quickly populate new areas. They're also not fussy eaters. They will eat pretty much anything they come across, from worms to beetles to crickets to blackberries and onion grass bulbs and even crabs they are not picky eaters at all and then they can live quite happily in modified landscapes so so they can thrive across farmland and there was even once population at the tip in Hamilton but the key to saving the species from extinction yeah, is to keep foxes away from them. And, and the way that we do this is we, we either build fences around reserves. So we, the, these are big predator exclusion fences. And we have four of these reserves across Victoria with bandicoots in them. And we also put them onto fox-free islands. And we've, we've released bandicoots onto three islands in Victoria so far. And the last thing we do is to, we, if there's a new trial that we're doing and we're trying to use, oops, let's go back. Nope. Marana guardian dogs. We're trialing these in these beautiful guardian dog species to see if we can use these dogs instead of fences to protect bandicoots from foxes. So in my job, I get to do lots and lots of different things and, and every day is different for me. And one of the most rewarding things that I do is when I get to release bandicoots into a new area. 
And a huge amount of work goes into this, you know, from the planning and preparing. Yeah, it can take years to, to, for a release to go ahead and a huge amount of people. But the moment that you take your bandicoots to a new site and you open up the box and you release those animals into that environment, that is such an emotional, powerful moment. It, it's, it's really fantastic. But that's when the worry starts to set in. You start to wonder, is this going to succeed? Is this going to work? And when you start monitoring your animals and you start collecting pictures like this on, on camera traps where you've got young at foot chasing their mums or you've got females with huge bulging pouches with large pouch young in there, you know, this is what success looks like. This is a population that is doing well and thriving. And these are all pictures that I've taken on, on French Island where we released bandicoots 18 months ago. So... In my job, so field work is, um, is one part of my job, but a big portion of my job is, is spent at my desk. You know, I might be analysing data or writing permit applications or in meetings discussing new projects or ideas or unexpected challenges, or I might be engaging with partners or, or working with my students. I've got several honours and PhD students that I supervise. So in my job, there are a couple of skills and attributes that I think are pretty important to have. And I'd say the most important one is to be passionate. Because if I wasn't passionate about the work that I do in saving species from extinction, then I don't think I'd be able to stay up until five o'clock in the morning trying to catch bandicoots. And I don't think I'd be able to inspire other people to want to help save species from extinction. So passion is, is incredibly important to have. The other one is, is really strong communication skills. So from being able to write scientific research articles to popular science articles or just little community updates to speaking to the media conferences or engaging with communities, it's really important to be able to connect with a wide range of people from a variety of different backgrounds. And, and that's because when scientists and governments and donors and community members when we all understand the problems that our threatened species face and when we all work together on solving the, um, and finding those solutions and working on them, that's when we can achieve great things for our threatened species and that's when we can save them from the brink of extinction. That's all from me. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Amy. I'm glad we could sort out the tech there. <laughs> so thank you to Manira, Misty and Amy for sharing your incredible array of knowledge, your stories and your experiences. And we hope you in the audience can reflect on these experience insights and opportunities presented by our speakers. They will all return for the question and answer session at the end of the event. But now I would like to introduce three scientists that form our panel today. We have Dr. Gillian Sparks, the Commissioner for Environmental Sustainability, Dr. Amanda Caples, Victoria's lead scientist, and Dr. Andrea Hinwood, Victoria's chief environmental scientist. These three scientists hold positions that are interconnected, yet they individually have distinct roles. Dr. Gillian Sparks, the Commissioner for Environmental, uh, sorry, the Commissioner for Environmental Sustainability, uh, her role is to provide independent and objective scientific reporting to inform policymakers, scientists and the Victorian community on the state's natural environment. These reports provide transparent evaluation of the state's environmental condition and considering international frameworks and promoting the adoption of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Essentially, the Commissioner's work aims to inspire practical action in Victoria. Welcome Dr Gillian Sparks, how are you today? Hi, Katrina. I'm very well and absolutely inspired uh, after listening to our wonderful speakers, the three speakers. It was just wonderful. Thank you. Well, absolutely great. Yeah. We also have Dr. Andrea Hinwood, Victoria's first chief environmental scientist. She is an accomplished environmental scientist with specialist expertise in environmental exposures and human health. Her role is to provide the Environment Protection Authority or EPA with science-based information and advice to reduce the harmful effects of pollution and waste. She also gives advice to senior decision makers, including EPA's leadership team, the Minister for Energy, Environment and Climate Change, and Victoria's Chief Health Officer. Welcome, Dr. Andrea Hinwood. How are you today? 
I'm really good. Hello, everyone. It's great to be here and to be talking about science and women in science. Right. Excellent. And last but not least, we have Dr. Amanda Cables, Victoria's lead scientist. Now, I won't describe her role because we actually have the perfect question from Saskia and Lily at Galen Catholic College to introduce her. We would like to know what Dr. Amanda Caples does in her role of being the lead scientist of Victoria. Thank you, girls, for what a, what a great question that is. Let me begin by just giving you briefly um, my experience. So I'm a pharmacologist uh, by background, and that's about understanding the actions of drugs in the body. And like Misty, I was inspired by uh, Jenna and the development of vaccines. And we've just seen what an incredible effort has been put into vaccine development over the past 12 months. So I, uh, I did a PhD, uh, then went into industry, and I went from experimental um, work, like Misty has described, into clinical trials, regulatory affairs, business development. And I tell you that story because I, the, the point that I'd like to communicate is that you do a science degree and you can add various skills as you choose the career path that you aspire to. And I came into government uh, 20 years ago now to uh, develop the industry, to develop the biotech industry. So I've had a great privilege uh, to do that. So today in my job as a lead scientist, I draw on all of those skills and experiences in understanding how uh, science works and how science is applied to industry and to uh, the development of economic policy. So the way that I describe my job, what I'm seeking to achieve is first and foremost, to advocate for STEM education uh, for all. As Manira said, education is a privilege and we need to ensure that everyone has access to the uh, resources that they need to choose their own career path. So advocacy for STEM and for women in STEM in particular, because as we know, there um, we, we don't have um, equal participation and that is so important for our future. Secondly, I argue for science as a means to grow jobs in the economy. And uh, throughout my efforts as the Director of Biotech and more recently as Lead Scientist, I bring together the evidence that supports policy positions that leads to programs that can support the science effort in Victoria. And then finally, what I do is look to the future, look at the technologies that are emerging, uh, whether they're quantum technologies, whether they're space technologies. Again, areas that I have no intrinsic experience in, but because I've got that uh, way of thinking about science and I recruit the people who have the expertise, that is what I can do in terms of bringing the right people together and, uh, and making something happen as a result of building those teams and being clear about how we can participate in, future, in, in the future. So I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you, Amanda. So there we have it. There are our three panellists. The purpose of today's panel is to provide you with insights about our panellists' real life experiences in the field of science. We have video questions that have been sent in from Victorian secondary students to kick off the discussion. And after the panel discussion, we'll be rejoined by Manira, Misty and Amy too. So for those of you in the audience, start thinking of your questions and we do invite you to submit questions directed to any of our speakers in the box below. Um, and you can also go to slido.com and use the hashtag IDWGS to submit your questions if you're broadcasting and um, have your own devices. Now, first up, we have a question from a student at Footscray High School. What made you interested in science and why did you choose your specific field? Gillian, I might get you to lead the panel discussion and, and kick off. Um, so what inspired your interest in, in your field of science? Thanks, Katrina, and thanks for the, the question. It's a great question to start with. 
My interest came uh, as a child, really, and picking up some of the comments the uh, speakers made before and Misty in particular, I was always a very curious child and very interested in how things worked and problem solving and wanting to look deeper into things. And when I went to school, I, I went to a public state school, both uh, primary and secondary. I always had uh, an interest in science, but I must admit, usually at my school back then, and I won't even give you the dates to date myself, um, the, there was male uh, maths and science teachers and usually female you know, English and history teachers. And although I had quite an interest in maths and science, I was quite good at it. I was also pretty interested in history and English but the defining moment for me was in my um, that year 10 or 11 in high school, I just got this amazing young female science teacher who taught us chemistry and she just brought chemistry to life and it just unleashed the passion in me for chemistry. And throughout my career then that has developed more broadly, but um, it was really seeing that role model, making that idea that I had in my head accessible and fun and I could identify with my teacher because I I look back now and think that teacher was probably in her late 20s. I'm pretty sure it would have been one of her first high school jobs teaching chemistry to our class. And she just was amazing and and I've always looked back and thanked her uh, for what she brought out in me. Thank you, Gillian. Um, We've heard a little bit about Amanda's story and journey. So maybe, Andrew, would you like to answer the question? Yeah, so mine's similar but not. I mean, I wanted to be a famous singer. So while I was curious as a, as a young person and I certainly liked science, I also became a music student and I was going to become a performer and I was going to wow you all with my brilliance. Well, clearly I haven't at this point in time. So if I look at my high school years, I actually had some presentations from people about the environment and about uh, species, threatened species and and what we were doing on the planet. And I guess at 15, I decided I wanted to save the world. And so in order to do that, I took a science path. It was also, I tried to do music as well, but um, at, at that time, my parents said, what are you doing? Go and get yourself a some sort of qualification. So I did environmental science and um, progressed through that area. But I have to say a lot of commonality with our earlier speakers and Gillian and Amanda in that I'm quite passionate about the environment that hasn't changed. I want to use science to make good decisions. And I guess I, I talk about science and STEM in the same way in that now the ability to use uh, data analytics and intelligence and the way that we can actually access information and data to inform decision-making so that we can actually put positive things in place for the environment is absolutely inspiring. So I still sing in the shower. Thank you. Well, there's nothing stopping you from singing about the environment as well. (laughs) Oh, well, actually I I do, but perhaps that's not something that I want to share. (laughs) Thank you. We've now got a question relevant to the question that I asked all of you in the audience at the beginning around stereotypes. What are gender stereotypes with women in science? So, Amanda, would you like to answer that question first? Uh, Yeah, look, I I think I'll I'll go with um, what readily springs to mind. And, and of course, um, it's, you know, the white coat and the glasses and the hair up and and all the rest of it. So that um, really nerdy type um, uh, look, I think, uh, is more prevalent uh, than we seek, you know, than we wish for. And, And I think You've seen from the panel members today and, uh, and and also our wonderful speakers that we're anything but that. And uh, and so uh, don't ever think that STEM pigeon calls you into behaving in a certain way or looking in a particular way. You can see from the breadth of the science that we all do that um, you can, there are just, it, it's so diverse and uh, and therefore the people and the and, and you know the 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 way that we present the what what we do is anything but 
being in a white coat and being a nerd. Yeah, thank you. Um, certainly, if you jump onto Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, all those kind of things, you, you'll be able to see a lot of female scientists who are anything but, you know, this, this typical stereotype. So definitely recommend doing that. But yeah, gender stereotypes can certainly be a challenge that's sometimes difficult to navigate. What obstacles have you faced as females in a STEAM career? Gillian, uh, what obstacles have you faced? Um, where did we start? <laughs> Look, I think uh, just reflecting on the previous question, I was thinking about Amanda's response, and and I do think there is that idea that um, that girls who do science are boring, and, and and even back when I was younger, not probably as clever as the boys, but we'll give them a go anyway. And um, and then there's the idea that they may disrupt the workplace once they get into science roles by stopping and having intervals where they need to, um, you know, have their family because, you know, because of uh, maternity leave, et cetera. So back in the, the 20th century, when I was working in industry as a scientist, those were sort of uh, some of the things and obstacles that I faced, just the things not so much about me and my capability, but the things that went around me um, that were related to me being uh, in my 20s, um, getting my first job, my boss did actually articulate that um, that his preference wouldn't have been a female because of this disruption to the workplace if you were to marry and have children and things like that. We've got to remember that even in the early uh, mid part of the 20th century, women had to give up their jobs when they started a family or got married. So I have to say I'm old enough to know that those sorts of things have long since left the workplace, thank goodness. Um, now, I think uh, that there's much less obstacles for females in the workplace. And, and in fact, in Victoria, and particularly in, in government where I'm working, but in so many places, diversity, inclusion, gender equality, it's a norm. I think people are much more progressive and liberated now and understand that um, that we can walk and chew gum, everyone is equal, we can, it's about ourselves. And, and so I think what I would say to all, all women and girls wanting to look at a STEM career, the only limitation really is the one you put on yourself because I actually think you can overcome the barriers if you just, um, if you just believe in yourself and you're passionate about what you want to do. You will get there. There's just not enough. There's too many problems to solve that we could exclude people anyway. Thank you. Andrea, um, have you experienced different hurdles and obstacles? Yeah, um, I guess like the others. And, and I guess I agree with Jill in that growing up, my major impediment and even when I got into a science career is myself, i.e. having that self-belief that, one, I actually deserve to be here and that I actually can do that because you do have this image that, you know, you're in a white coat with glasses that you're exceptionally bright and that in at my age that and that you're male. So, you know, in, in my career, I did have uh, experiences where I wasn't allowed to go into a lab because not because I didn't have the right role, but because how would I know how to use this piece of analytical instrumentation, for example. But again, I've overcome all of that clearly. And um, but I do think the self talk is the thing you really need to overcome um, and that's really important and that's advice I would give to anyone. Yeah that's definitely an excellent point thank you. Uh, Amanda have you had to jump over different hurdles? Yes and, and I think a, a common thread through uh, all of the speakers today is how everyone has forged their own path and it goes to the points that, that Jill and Andrea are making, and, and I'll reframe, and it was the same for me insofar as uh, needing to back yourself in. Uh, and, you know, it's, a, it's commonly said that, um, you know, a major difference between men and women is that, you know, men will go for something, go for an opportunity, even if they've only got 10% or 20% or whatever the figure is of the, the skills and the experience to be successful in that. Whereas us women tend to uh, uh, think that we, we need to be overqualified in order to do it. So 
So I think our, I agree with the others in so far as sometimes the biggest obstacle is ourselves and um, and uh, being jumping in the deep end is okay. And guess what? Uh, you're you're not going to be alone. And the way that you can mitigate that risk is is find a friend, you know. And um, and there are so many people who are really keen to help you and to mentor you and and don't ever be afraid of asking for help. The best piece of advice I ever got was from my PhD supervisor who said to me, you know, Amanda, you are going to be an expert in whatever field that you, you seek to uh, focus on. And as a consequence of that, you're going to have minimal knowledge on everything else. So don't ever pretend that you need to know everything about everything. You just find others who complement your skill set. And so I think that that's one way of overcoming what is the largest obstacle, which is, is ourselves. The other thing that I would add is that um, uh, is the biggest barrier I think is style and um, and so what we all need to do no matter who we are and, and where we are is to understand the culture seek to change the culture but uh, to uh, find our own way of having a presence in the room and what I mean by that is that in some environments and you can pick it pretty readily and I've had experience, I've had great experiences where the culture has been very permissive and I've had experience where it's been the exact opposite. And, um, and in order to survive in those environments where it's not necessarily conducive, I think you can play a leadership role in being true to yourself and, and find ways around dealing with a male-dominated culture such that your voice can be heard. And, and you know, I, I left a, a job many years ago now where the managing director actually said to me, Amanda, because we'd always clashed and I couldn't quite work out what was going on, you know, you know when you, know, you just can't put your finger on it. And, um, and it was a clash of styles. And he said, you've actually taught me that there is a different way of getting things done, which was a really big admission uh, of, of, of him. So that would be, um, I think, another valuable learning that uh, I've uh, had that I think has stood me well in terms of other situations that I've been in and um, and you know you've got a choice you can you can work through it or you can leave really and um, and so just listen to your inner voice and um, and stay true to your values when you find obstacles that uh, will always present themselves to you because they present themselves to everyone so don't feel that uh, you're alone uh, so find a friend and and find your own style and and stick with what you're comfortable with. Thank you to all three of you for answering that question. Now we've talked about the problems and we've already started to hear little nuggets of wisdom and advice and solutions. Um, but yeah, let, let's move on to solving some of these obstacles. How did you address the gender gap in your specific area of science? Jill, how do you address the gender gap? Well, um, I'm fortunate in the work that I do now and I want to focus on the current because everyone who's listening in is, is young and, and looking ahead. Um, in the work that I do and uh, with Victorian Government, we have, um, we have addressed the gap, policy gap uh, formally through policy settings, so um, gender, gender quotas, those sorts of things. Um, and then informally, I always uh, work with young women and, and men and encourage them and coach them to, you know, to help them succeed in their roles. But I, I'm, a, I'm a really great believer that without formal policy settings and some uh, governance around the idea that, you um, that we must bring diversity into workplaces that, 
that it's very hard to happen because most people, uh, this anecdotally or formally, I'm not sure, um, recruit roles in the image of themselves. That is well known. And the idea that there's less meritorious women to get senior roles or any role for that matter than there are meritorious men and yet we still have some organisations that, you know, are struggling to get 30% or 20% women into senior roles just doesn't cut it for me. So I do think we need policy settings that are formal and support um, women to, you know, to get into roles and then make their own way. They should get there on merit and, you know, um, make their own way after that. So in the Victorian public service, we have all that. So we have lots of opportunities. It's a great place to work. There's actually never been a better time to work in the Victorian public service as a woman, in my view. Um, but, yeah, I still also take on a strong role as a coach, a mentor, a supporter, a connector. So I do a lot of connecting for um, mid, mid-career professionals who are looking for the next job. It's not just about coaching. It's actually about introducing to people might help create opportunities for them. So I'm quite an active connector that way. So I've got lots of uh, tools in my kit, but I'm passionate about it, but I am passionate about the the formal policy settings and and the targets to make sure that we do do unlock some of the institutional barriers and the cultural barriers. Thanks, Jill. Right. Um, Amanda, you sort of oversee and and have a grasp of science across Victoria. how, how do you think we can address the gender gap? Uh, so I think what we can do, so apart from running great events uh, like this, is to increase awareness of uh, different opportunities for greater engagement uh, for STEM and whether that's co-educational or programs designed specifically for girls and women in STEM. And so an initiative that I started last year and I was pleased that uh, with Minister Pulford, uh, the Minister for Innovation, Medical Research and Digital Technologies, we launched at Swinburne University just a week or two ago in advance uh, of today, was a um, Girls and Women in STEM map, which seeks to categorise 175 programs that are available to inspire primary, secondary tertiary and professional women in in STEM. And so what we have sought to do is to bring all of those uh, programs together in one place. So if you're a student and you're interested in understanding what's available to you to tap into, you can go to this resource and, and find uh, and find a link to relevant programs. And of course, if you're a teacher, uh, you can who need support in the classroom, you can equally go to this to understand what's available and you, you get the general drift. It's about uh, increasing awareness of uh, all of these programs which exist. And so we're, we're trying to create further impact of these programs by enabling people to access them and, of course, also to join the dots across those programs so that... Um, Uh, We minimise duplication where it's not necessary, uh, where we can produce scale on particular activities and uh, and facilitate uh, collaboration. So that's what we're doing and what we've done uh, uh, and and is now out and is available uh, on my website. The other thing that we will be working on, uh, particularly for this year, because as Jill mentioned, the government uh, introduced last year, we're the first state government to have a gender equality bill, and there are obligations uh, on that bill for public agencies. And of course, I'll be participating in the in um, in uh, contributing to enacting uh, uh, those, you know, the intent uh, of that bill. But I think uh, in addition to that, we have, uh, there is a national push on increasing the involvement of girls and women in STEM. So I look forward to working with uh, the Australian Ambassador for STEM, Lisa, Professor Lisa Harvey-Smith, and coordinating across the nation and contributing to the effort more broadly around encouraging girls and women in science. Thank you, Amanda. 
Andrew, do you have anything that you want to add in in your experience and, and from what you can see? So just the Victorian um, public service is terrific in this regard. And I have to say, I've come over here from Western Australia, and this is the first time in my life that I've actually worked for women, which has been uh, really good. The only other thing I would say is we do see a significant drop off in STEM, in, in girls taking up STEM subjects in high school. And it, and it does happen early in high school. And so I think the work that Amanda is doing across schools and some of the other programs in STEM that Sara are doing um, will really, really help in that regard. And it, I think we do have to do some more work to work out why, because particularly in mathematics, um, chemistry, et cetera, um, we need to do some more to actually advance that because we're gonna need those skills for the future. Yeah, it's great to hear that there are, you know, there are already improvements and then there are also things underway so that we can see more and more improvements. It's absolutely fantastic. On a more positive note, let's talk about some of your accomplishments. What have you done in your career that you're most proud of? Gillian, what are you most proud of in your career? <laughs> well, sort of. Obviously, being Victoria's Commissioner for Environmental Sustainability is the role that is, you know, is the honour of my life in terms of a role. Um, so that goes without saying, and I feel very privileged and honoured every day to have the role that I have and to work with the people I work with. But more um, closer to home, I do think that one of my greatest successes is that I've always loved the work that I've done. Um, I've always gone to work, well, mostly, I mean, not every day, but mostly, you know, with a spring in my step. I really enjoy my, I've always worked in science in some form, with, but, but into leadership and management roles. I worked in industry and then into government and influencing policy, but but I've loved every day, really. I, I, I think I'm most proud of um, really living the idea that, that um, that science has bring me that you know that science is bringing me joy. Um, my curiosity as an individual, marrying that with my profession and my ability to influence as a leader. So all of those things that mean I feel um, very fulfilled personally as well as professionally is probably what I'm most proud of work wise. Um, but the work that my team and I do now, looking at uh, Victoria's environment, developing baseline reporting on the health of the environment, advancing our understanding and knowledge, taking work that people like Andrea and Amanda and Amy and the threatened species, the zoo people, um, all those scientists are doing. Our work collates all of that and gives a bird's eye view, if you like, a snapshot of what's actually happening and where the big next five to 10 year policy and intervention challenges are. So, I, I, I love every day of what I do and I think that's what makes me so proud. That's great. Thank you. And hopefully all of you in the audience will one day be absolutely loving what you're doing in the future too. Andrea, what, uh, or what, what is one of the career highlights that you've had? Well, my, my current job is a highlight because I get to do the science to provide the evidence base for solving environmental problems. So that's an absolute privilege. But I have been really fortunate. And I think from a career point of view, I have been able to work internationally. I have worked on program programs, international programs to protect the ozone layer. And the achievements um, during that period are something I'm extremely proud of, both for the work that was done in Australia and internationally, but to acknowledge that it's never an individual in this space. There's a whole range of people that actually help you do that work. And perhaps now's a good time to tell you that my absolute crowning achievement is in a few weeks, um, I'll actually be leaving EPA Victoria to take up the Chief Scientist of the United Nations Environment Program role. And so for me, that's an incredible privilege and an opportunity to actually uh, protect the environment. So as a young person who never thought that they would miss, who didn't really think this would happen, I can tell all of you out there, it can happen to anyone. <laughs> That's super exciting. Congratulations. 
And Amanda, what has been one of the highlights of your career? Yeah, um, what a great, again, another great question. So uh, there have been many things that I've been proud of that we've been able to achieve, but I think probably the one that I would highlight is, and it really stems back to about 14 years ago, where uh, we released um, uh, a statement, a Healthy Futures a Statement, uh, which was about transforming uh, Victoria's medical research uh, effort. And through that initiative, uh, we funded the expansion of the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute, enabled the amalgamation of neuroscience institutes into what is now the um, Melbourne Brain Centre and the Flory Institutes. We established the Australian Regenerative Medicine Institute we uh, built a facility that enabled the merger of the Burnett Institute with the Austin Research Institute. So through this effort, and, and we did it all in six weeks in terms of putting up uh, the, the, the policy and, and getting uh, approval to proceed with it. So it was probably the, the fastest um, uh, process that I've ever experienced in government. And so it doesn't matter whether I go to Parkville or down to the Alfred uh, or down to Clayton at Monash or even here in Heidelberg uh, where, where, where I live uh, and, um, and at the Austin Hospital uh, at Agrobio at La Trobe, you can see the impact of those investments and just feel inside that you've done something special. So you had an important role for a short period of time and a lot of other people have put in an incredible amount of effort to get these facilities to where they are today. And it's, it's just really rewarding to see how uh, this uh, period of time has led to a transformation of Victoria's science base and, and a base that has stood us in good stead, as we've seen over uh, the last 12 months in, in dealing with uh, the response uh, to the coronavirus pandemic. So, yeah, it's, um, you know, just having had that uh, short input and seeing the benefits beyond that has been the most rewarding experience uh, that I've had. Thank you. And for can I also say, first of all, congratulations, Andrea. That is a stunning achievement and we're very proud of you. And then secondly, can I say one of the great um, pleasures that I have in my role is working with um, colleagues like Andrea and, and Jill. So as you can tell from, I think, the way that we interact on this panel and the fact that we work together in bringing this event, it is um, what you see is what you get. I mean, we are genuinely collaborative. We ring each other up uh, all the time and say, hey, you know, we came across this. Um, this looks to be something that might be of interest to you. Uh, and, you know, we work together. And I think that's really important for women in STEM uh, to work together and, um, you know, we can all achieve a lot more uh, by that coordination. So anyway, I thought Good I'd do it. Really Andrea, that, um, Amanda, fantastic. Well said and congratulations, Andrea. We are all so very proud of you. It's a wonderful achievement. Katrina, can I just add one thing that we haven't done yet, but we're working on collaborative collaboratively, which is on the space and spatial agenda for Victoria. So one of the things that we collaborate on across uh, Andrea, um, Amanda and myself is, is the opportunity to bring space uh, data and spatial data, earth observation data, and use it for solving difficult problems um, and uh, that, that technology side of science. So we're working on that now and hoping to uh, ensure that um, Victoria and Australia are doing really well in that space. That's going to be our proud achievement at the next forum, maybe. <laughs> Thank you. And just as a final question for the panel, Paris, 
uh, from Galen has a more specific question about climate change. My question is to Dr. Gillian Sparks. What is the biggest priority in combating climate change? Is it education and media to spread awareness? Is it environmental or government policies? Or is it industries and businesses doing their bit? Wow, that's a great question. And uh, following on from my comments about technology, um, and how do we deal with these big complex issues? We know climate change is a complex issue. It requires a comprehensive and enduring response across education, policy, technology and action and across all sectors of the community. So um, I think we all have a role to play, but bringing it back to the purpose of today, I, I did want to share with you that uh, you know, science and scientists are key to the climate change issue and dealing with climate change. Um, I can't overstate the importance of investment in science, research, technology and STEM skills in dealing with climate change. And if we go back to 2019, I was uh, privileged to be at a lecture that uh, University of New South Wales professor and climate scientist Andy Pittman um, gave at the Royal Society of Victoria. It was a wonderful lecture about dealing with climate change and the role of technology and space and spatial data. And Andy's thesis was that we need four things to deal with climate change. We need serious computing, and he really emphasised the serious, like really big computing for really big data. We need a huge investment in data science. We need outstanding technical people and we need outstanding scientists. I wrote those four points down. That was the big sort of takeout from Andy's, Andy's um, presentation and lecture. It was wonderful. And, um, and I think he's right. I think everybody has their role to play across all sectors of the economy at all levels from the local to the global, but we do need science and science scientists play a critical role. So it's our, our passion for science that bring us here today and my hope is that you will all be inspired to study STEM and pursue STEM careers and um, hopefully you'll be part of the climate change solution. Uh, we need you and our planet needs you. Thank you. And I, I do want to get all the other speakers back in. So, but, but just before we do that, Andrea, given that your role is about promoting action, um, particularly in terms of the environment, would you like to make a brief comment? Yeah, I, I think that we have an opportunity to do the science that actually shows what works um, because we are at a point where we can, you know, I don't believe that we are actually limited. I, I believe if you look at everything that's occurred throughout history, we are incredibly innovative. And I think what's exciting about the future is actually about the way that we do that work and the way that we can, you know, whether you are a data analyst or a coder or a conservation biologist or a, or a chemist, you have a role to play in the type of work that is actually going to improve the environment, which is going to improve things for our future. So I, I, I guess that's the, the science that we want to apply, in my case, to environmental problems. And I think we are absolutely uh, able to achieve that. And so I just encourage everybody who's interested in this field, if, you know, in whatever way, this is so exciting because this is our future and what a fantastic positive uh, influence we can have from now on. So I guess that's a view. Thank you. And to everyone in the audience, you, you will be driving and, and shaping our future. So thank you very much to the panellists for providing us with, with your insights and to the students for sending in your questions. That wraps up our panel, but now we're going to open the questions to you in the virtual audience. We welcome back our speakers to participate in this open session. And just a reminder, you are welcome to submit questions in the box below, or if you're watching as a group, you can use your own device going to slido.com and type in the code IDWGS for the question submission portal. So right off the bat, Sarah from Galen Catholic College has a question for Amy. Okay. My question is to Dr. Amy Coatsy. What is the most endangered species in Victoria right now and what can we do to help? 
do we have Amy? Yep, we do. Yes. <laughs> can, it, can you hear me this time? Excellent. <laughs> um, that's a great question. Um, so the most endangered mammal in Victoria would be the brush-tailed rock wallaby um, that um, came dangerously close to the – well, the bushfires last year came dangerously close to the last main population in Gippsland last year. Luckily, um, the fires stopped before they got to them. Um, but we have 27 threatened species in um, that we work with at Zoos Victoria. So these range from the tiny little keys matchstick grasshopper to bauble frogs to helmeted honey eaters. And these are all species that are at risk of extinction within the next 10 years. So they're all at, on the brink of extinction. And th there's lots of things that we can all do. Um, one thing you can do with your school is get your school signed up as one of our Zoos Victoria's fighting extinction schools. We've got a whole range of information on our website about how you can get involved in education programs that we offer. Um, and you can also do you know, simple things you can do, like keeping your cat inside or blowing bubbles instead of balloons at outdoor events. So th there's little things that we can all do to help threatened species that when we all do them, um, have a really big impact for our wildlife. Thank you, Amy. And it's great that you can, you know, tell us what we can do now, which is which is fantastic. And Lucy has a question for Misty. My question is to Dr. Misty Jenkins. How has your job as an immunologist changed since COVID hit? Thanks so much for the question. And what a great year to be an immunologist. I mean, the whole world's talking about immunology right now with COVID, right? So that's the first thing I was thinking is just acknowledging that we're all talking about it, that the, that the scientific literacy of the public is aware of what a vaccine is and what it, you know, what's the difference between different vaccine formulations. Um, so that's great. In terms of my day-to-day, -day, it got impacted quite a lot, actually, because like lots of other workplaces, we had to close down, you know, and with the requirement for social distancing in our laboratory. So that made it really hard for me to teach um, all of my students and sit next to people at the lab bench because we had to remain at least 1.5 metres apart and we had our PPE. Um, but it also meant that we couldn't do a, a certain experiments, actually. Um, and so uh, we had to really shut down and went down to very low capacity in the building. So that, what that has meant as a scientist, particularly where we're doing um, cancer research that relies on using animal models, so we'll give little mice brain cancer and then we will cure their brain cancer and try different therapies, um, that has meant that that's been really affected for, by, and put us back by quite a few months, unfortunately. But we're ramping up again now and fingers crossed uh, we, can, we can catch up. Thank you, Misty. And a question to Manira. Um, artificial intelligence is, is becoming such a big thing. The internet, we all rely on the internet so much. So how has your job changed and, and sort of what, what's your perspective on, on this rapid, I guess, increase in, in our use of information and, and putting our, our data into everything? Um, how has that sort of changed? I think uh, one of the recent direction in my research that uh, uh, we are looking at is the biases in the data, because uh, just like you mentioned that AI and the robotics, they are going to be the future of the world and uh, a lot of societal uh, dimensions are going to depend on it, whether it's education, whether it's going to be the medicine, it's vehicles, transportation, government, surveillance. Uh, if we are not careful about the data and the training of the AI-based systems, we might be exacerbating the human biases by giving them computational power. So th this is where my research lies on providing the ethical frameworks and uh, bringing the diversity and inclusion aspects so that in future, if we are going for AI-based solutions, it's for benefit of everyone, not just for a particular uh, set of people. Thank you, Anira. And now we have a question that's that's come in that's sort of more open. Um, what advice would you give your 21-year-old self? So maybe Jill, I'll start with you. Thanks, Katrina. You always start with me and then I listen to everyone else and think, oh, yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. My 21-year-old self, I would definitely say just believe in yourself more, getting right back to the question that, uh, that started the session, 
for the panel. Um, we need to believe in ourselves. As women, we always think we're just not quite as good as we should be. We're not perfect. We can't do this. We can't do that. We always focus on what we can't do. We forget to focus on what we can do. We set ridiculously high expectations for ourselves. And I, I think I would just, again, um, advise myself to, to have more self-belief and um, just, just don't be worried about what everyone else is thinking and doing because you are good enough. Thank you. Uh, Amy, what advice would you give your 21-year-old self? I think I should have had Gillian advising my 21-year-old self. Um, that's, uh, yeah, I, I can care, you know, believe in yourself. Um, don't be so worried and afraid of what other people might think. I was... Um, I was incredibly shy and still am incredibly introverted. So it, it took me a very long time to to find my voice and start using my voice and become confident at at speaking to people and in, engaging people. So, so yeah, so belief, self belief, um, is is really what I'd stress to my twenty one year old self. I believe in myself as well. Thank you. And um, what about you, Misty? Oh, look, all, all of that as well. Probably also to sort of probably um, don't drink so much beer, um, work hard. Um, and, but to real, oh, wait, look, I'm joking, but also just to really, what one thing that, you know, I've really appreciated throughout my journey is having really good mentors. And I, you know, I have lots of them, you know, males, females, scientists, non scientists, and I go to them at different times for different reasons. And so one thing I think that I probably didn't appreciate as much as I did you know, further down the track was to really appreciate and nurture those relationships, which I absolutely do do now. Um, but just to know that, you know, that the, you know, there are lots, there is a whole community, you know, sometimes it does take a village and that you're not on your own, that you can surround yourself with like-minded people. Like going through university, I had study groups. I had, you know, I worked with my mates, um, you know, we'd, we'd summarise the lecture notes and pass them around to each other. So, you know, that's, that you don't have to do it all on your own and that, and that it's okay to ask for help and it's okay to be part of a community in a village. Um, and sometimes, you know, that can really give you sometimes that motivation when you're feeling low um, or that just that little piece of advice that's going to get you through that exam or whatever it is, but just to, to you know, to use those networks and communities around you. I'm really glad that you brought up that point because that's something that we'll, we'll touch on later, but I just want to quickly still keep going around and getting little snippets of advice from everyone. Manira, what advice would you give to your 21 year old self? Wow, where to start? <laughs> so I think uh, I would tell my 21 year old self that it's okay to feel lost sometime and not have answer to every question. There will come time when you will know the answers, you will find out what you want to do. So not knowing everything is totally okay at that age. And uh, also if someone calls you an overambitious woman just because you have dreams that no one else has achieved, so be the first one and go ahead and don't feel bad about it. Thank you. Uh, Andrea, what advice would you give? Well, mine would definitely be um, have self-belief because I didn't at 21. But um, I guess the other thing I would also say is um, to relax. Like at, at 21, it's the start of, of what you're going to do and you don't have to have everything sorted out really early. And if you can just relax, follow that passion or that spark, um, I think I could have probably saved myself a whole lot of angst. Yep. <laughs> And last but not least, Amanda, you've, you know, given us lots of advice. What advice would you give for yourself, your younger self? <laughs> yeah, uh, so similarly, you know, you don't need to do everything yourself. And so successful people surround themselves by people who can add value and, and are expert in areas that you're not. You know, so you can't be an expert in, in, in all areas. So that would be one piece of advice. And, and then also... Um, to say that from time to time you need to take risks. Uh, we all take risks and, uh, and from time, sometimes they work out and sometimes they don't. And so what I would advise my 21 year, uh, year old self is 
get over it more quickly, <laughs> pick yourself up uh, and, uh, and, and rebound. And, uh, and that's something that uh, life experience teaches you. I wish I knew that better at 21. Uh, I've learned it now and it's a really important skill set to develop. Thank you, everyone. Um, and now we'll circle back to Misty's point. Uh, Misty, maybe you want to start us off. How did you find a mentor and how do they support you? Yeah, I think thank you for asking the question. I think this is a really great question because we hear this all the time, don't we? Get a mentor, get a mentor, get a mentor. But how? How do we do that? And what does it what does it mean? And so for me, mentoring is, is a two-way relationship. You know, you have to have a rapport with a person that that senior person has to have a vested interest in you they have to like you they have to want to see you be you know to be succeed and to do well and so um so one thing i would not do is write to a random stranger and say i really admire you will you be my mentor probably not as if they're going to say yes they don't know who you are what i would suggest is you know to find if you want to be a one of you want to be an in, environmental scientist, you, you know, find the best damn environmental scientist you can and write to them and say, can I have 20 minutes of your time? Can I buy you a cup of coffee? Can we have a chat? I'm really keen to ask you a few questions about how you got there. And then you'll find that if you develop a rapport over time, that becomes a, you know, a lovely relationship, then, then you can formalise the relationship. But certainly it needs to be a two-way street. So that's the first piece of advice I'd give. And also more than that is that, is that um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, not just one. You know, sometimes you need different mentors come come at you know giving advice from their own life and world experience um, and 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 views. And so sometimes you know, you, sometimes it's in order to take those make those risky decisions, like Amanda was talking about. Sometimes you just need to hear things from a different angle or see things from a different point of view. And that's the whole point of getting advice and getting mentorship. Um, and I think you know, as probably Amanda and Jill and Andrew would also say that then you know it's you learn from your mentees as well when you're a mentor, don't you? And, and it's lovely, you know, when you, you have this relationship that can be ongoing sometimes over many, many years. And in, in fact, you know, for my entire career, you know, I've maintained, um, you know, my net, my networks and connections with those mentors. So, yeah, so I'd be knocking on the door, emailing, you know, getting in contact with people that you find inspiring. And you'll find that actually, you know, um, really amazing people will uh will also are just humans at the end of the day. You know, they're also someone's family member and that they, you know, when they're contacted by young, enthusiastic, clever um, girls and, and young women um, who are just keen for some information, they'll you'll find that doors will open. You know, you'll find that everyone will be more than happy to give you a piece of advice or, you know, push you in that direction or make a connection here or introduce you to, to someone to talk to. So um, I, I'm, I'm a big believer in that opportunities, you don't just take opportunities that pass you by, that you go out and you create them, you make them happen. So being really proactive about it um, is the third piece of advice. Thank you, Misty. Uh, just a reminder that you can keep these questions rolling in, put them in the in the little box below. Um, Manira, you entered a field where you know you, you've said there there weren't so many women around when you were going through. So, how did you find mentors, and and how have they supported you? Ah, uh, yes, uh, Katrina. So I just like I mentioned that uh, I'm. From a very young age, the, when it comes to education or uh, career, there was not a single woman around me that I could, you know, approach or ask them on guide me or what to do. So the initial guidance always was my family coming from my father, who was a highly educated man. So that cultural setup was that all the men, they were exceptionally educated, but all the women in our family, they were never given that opportunity. So I had to look for towards my father and my uncles and then later on to my brothers. And moving into science was, again, because my brothers, they were in science, so they could only guide me into that field. So that's how I m moved after them. It was so late after when I was in university that the first time one of my male teacher who told told me that I have the potential to become an international researcher and may make my mark into the field of computer science. Uh, something that I really wanted to do, but I didn't know if I have what it takes. And he was the first one who told me, yes, you can. Uh, till that point, I was always being told that this is an overambitious dream, that uh, you should conform to what society has the roles for the women. 
And I think having that one person giving you a nice and kind pat on the shoulder to say, yes, you have what it takes, it makes a huge difference. So that was the first time and it came from a male teacher. It was only when I arrived in Australia that I got female mentors who were really exceptionally great women and they had great advice. But by then, I already was uh, going through my PhD. But uh, during my childhood, yes, I had to figure out things on my own. And I think on quite a number of occasions, uh, it would have been great if someone could have guided properly. But at the same time, figuring out things on your own makes you a great learner and gives you a lot of confidence and resilience that is really valuable later in life for just like Amanda was mentioning, for taking risks, you need a lot of courage. So it was worth it. Thank you, Minera. I'm glad you persevered. Uh, Amy, um, what about you? How did you find mentors? So similar to Manira, when I was um, growing up, um, I didn't know anybody that worked in conservation and didn't have access to anyone that I could speak to. And so it was only when I came to Australia, when I emigrated here, and I found some volunteer work working with Tasmanian Devils. And uh, that was my, my first experience of, of speaking with researchers working in conservation. And I spent three fabulous weeks working with Tassie Devils. And and I think volunteer work is is incredibly important to do if you want to work in the conservation sector. It um, it gives you a, a plethora of skills, and it gets you um, you get to know different people, and they get to know your skills. So it's incredibly valuable. Um, but I guess my my first mentor was my PhD supervisor at Melbourne University, and um, he was the first one that believed in me, and he was the one that encouraged me, always encouraged me to to be the best that I could be, and and believed in me. So um, he's and, and I still have a great relationship with him today, and and now you know as you you continue to work in the field, you get to know more people from from different organisations, and we all just feed off each other. And I work with an incredible team of people at Zoos Victoria, and um, we all help each other out and and give each other advice. And and now you know I find myself mentoring other people that are coming up, you know, whether they're students or people who work at the zoo that want to be more involved in conservation. So it's incredibly rewarding to be able to to pass um, my advice onto other people so that they can pursue their careers in conservation too. Thank you, Amy. We have a question for Andrew. What are the steps in your career that led you to your new job at, in the UN? That's, that's a really good question. Um, I, I think, um, I, I think because I started out doing environmental science, I pursued postgraduate studies um, by doing a master's and I, my PhDs in environmental epidemiology. And I have worked for um, regulators, EPA in Victoria and Western Australia, but I also looked after an academic department. I was an academic for many years, which gave me exposure to a whole range of different disciplines um, to my own. So, so my, my comfort zone, for example, is pollution and waste. It's what I really love. It's what I know quite well. But when I actually became a head of school uh, of a university department, I got to look after conservation, biology, chemistry, um, you know, and a, a range of different disciplines. And so I had to uh, understand that. And so I think from a, a work point of view, um, I, have to, I have to confess it has not been planned. But what I have done is that I have taken risks and I have followed a spark. And when I've looked at the next opportunity, I've gone, does that excite me? And every time it does, I've gone for it. And I think because I've been passionate and I've really wanted to do the job, it's it's panned out well. So um my my career, and some would say that this is quite late in my career. I have got a couple of kids as well um, through that period, but I've kind of kept that path on and it's always been there. I always wanted to work in the environment, environment space. I've always wanted to protect the environment and to do positive things because I think we can. So I think, you know, my career path has has perhaps not been as fast as, as many others, but it's certainly all been 
uh, in a direction to to take me to this new role. Thanks for the question. Thank you. It's super exciting as well. Um, a question that I might start off with asking to Am um, yeah, Amanda. <laughs> um, what can teachers and parents do to encourage others in STEM or get in encourage people to get into STEM? Uh, I think I support students in whatever uh, way the, uh, the the student uh, is interested. You know, what, what whatever aspect, and 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 you know, really to support the curiosity, provide alternatives uh, as to uh, how uh, how that um, pathway can be followed, and I think also uh, help identify the search space for roles that that passion can be channeled into. So we often think about careers in terms of doctors, dentists, whatever, train drivers. And, and so we, we, we tend to label jobs and um, therefore think in terms of what do you need to do in, in order to be qualified for that job. But of course, there are so many other uh, occupations uh, that are required in so many fields from taking things from discovery through to market. So I always use the example, no one grows up with the idea of um, intending to be a procurement officer, but the whole economy wouldn't work if we didn't have people who uh, have adopted that as as their career choice. And in that kind of field, you need you know strong maths background, you need to understand broader systems and processes. So, so really uh, uh, helping to uh, find the, the career options that correlate with the student's passion and purpose. And going back to, you know, to the comment that uh, Andrea made, passion and purpose really drive what we do. And you'll find that if you're really clear about the passion and the purpose, which doesn't mean that you need to have all the answers, but you, there, there is a phenomenon called you know, gravitational pull. Uh, I'm sure you've, you've come across it in basic science and in and physics. And what you find is that people with strong a strong sense of purpose and passion have this uh, invisible gravitational pull that, that people gravitate to people, like-minded people and people who can really help uh, gravitate to those who are really clear on that. And I think that's what it's all about and how teachers and parents can help uh, their, uh, their uh, kids to identify what their purpose and passion is and provide the support to enable them to embark on their path. Great, thank you. And you know what, you know, the, the job that you might have in the future might not exist now. Um, like I was in high school not too long ago and science communication wasn't a big thing then and now that's sort of my area. So, you know, you never know what's going to pop up. Uh, would anyone else like to comment on what teachers and parents can do? Otherwise, we can move on to the next question. I just wanted to add to Amanda's um, comment, Katrina, just to say the teachers and from my own experience when I was a student in high school, making the chemistry class fun was really, really important. I wanted to go to the class because the teacher was fun. We did really cool experiments so we could see things changing in test tubes and different things. And it was fun to go to. It, was, um, it wasn't just, you know, boring and books and pens and reading long, you know, texts out of uh, science journals or something. So a bit of fun in your life really helps. Great. Um, someone says that this has been an inspiring conversation. That's awesome. Great to hear. Uh, what are the two key skills or attributes that are important to become successful in having a career in science? Um, maybe, Manira, I'll start with you. Thanks, Katrina. Um, from my personal experience, the first one was that I had a genuine passion for science. Uh, I was not sure when I was studying, when I was in school, that I will have a career, but I just loved it. And that uh, working hard 
to get the top grades because that was something I was passionate about. Uh, gradually, it led me to go into computer science and also to have a career there. So it started with the fact that I actually had a passion for the career of this field. Uh, the second would be to work hard to achieve the grades that no one can bring hurdles in your way. Uh, so passion and working hard. These would be the two advices that I would give. Thanks, Manira. Um, Jill, what about you? What, what two key skills or attributes are important in your eyes? Well, I agree with uh, Manira, passion and working hard. So if I add to them, I think that um, for a career in science, having a real interest in solving problems and being curious is 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 a personal attribute that uh, I think makes the best scientists. They want to keep doing more. Um, and one of the important things in life for achieving in anything is focus. Thank you. Amy, what about you? We'll just keep adding to this list. <laughs> Yeah, passion is absolutely number one. Um, you know, if if you're not, or if I wasn't passionate about the work that I do, um, I wouldn't be able to, you know, forego sleep for a week so I can monitor bandicoots. You know, I do at times feel like I've become nocturnal, just like the bandicoots are, and it's that love of my job and the passion for helping save these species that that drives me to 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 do those things and yeah i think if you're you have determination and you're passionate then then you will succeed um you just got to keep going there, there'll be hurdles that are thrown in your way but you'll find a way to overcome them and you know it might take 17 years to get that dream job of yours you know but that journey along the way is is exciting and it's fun and it all contributes to that that job that you end up getting in the end um so yeah passion determination curiosity continue to ask questions great scientists always ask questions and it doesn't matter what the question is just keep asking questions Thanks, Amy. Misty, do you have any that you want to add? I've got so many, but just to build on top of what's already been said, because passion, yes, absolutely, 100%. And, and, and curiosity, but for me, for me, it's more about creativity as well. I mean, Andrea, Catriona, both singers, I'm a singer. You, you know, you actually need, sometimes you need to think outside the box to answer really challenging and difficult questions. You have to think about things in a way that haven't been thought about before. Um, and so you actually need to be creative to do that. Um, and I think resilience, you know, you, you know, you get told no a lot, things don't work a lot, you know, your experiment falls on the floor, it, something goes wrong, your cells die, what, lots of things can go wrong, you don't get that grand, you haven't got the funding, like, you know, there's a lot of knockbacks and so you definitely need a thick skin to, and, you know, you need a bit of resilience to be a scientist and, you know, let's not, let's not lie about that it's pre and pretend it's all easy, um, it's not, it's, you know, it's a, it's, it can be pretty tough. Um, so, yeah, but so it's about just and like what, what Amanda was saying before about, um, you know, taking risks and just and, you know, but 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 the ability to then pick yourself up very quickly um, and, and move back on to the next challenge, you know, and just, you know, you get you get knocked down and you get up again. Great. Thank you. Um, Andrea, would you like to add to that? Otherwise, I've got, I've got another question for you. Well, I, I say there are many more we could talk about. Go to the next question. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, it gets harder and harder as your last, like to, to keep adding. Um, so what, what, what do you think the role of men is in increasing the participation of women and girls in science? We talked about what we can do. What, what can what can men do? Do you want me to answer that? Yes. Yeah. I, I, um, I was actually going to say when it comes to mentoring, the only mentors I've ever had are men. And they have supported me enormously and I would not be doing what I'm doing now had I not had incredible people who I worked with and those that actively mentored me. And I think it's, um, to me, it's about the diversity and inclusion question in that, you know, I'm a bit weird, right? And so just to be able to um, accept me for the way I am and the way that I operate and not have preconceived ideas that just because I might be a little bit more dramatic than others doesn't mean I'm any less of a scientist, for example. So I think the thing I would say to my male colleagues is perhaps get out of that view that you have about what a female scientist is 
And, um, and I mean, I've been very fortunate. So I work with a great group of great group of men, but there are some that will have preconceived ideas about who we are, what we do and how we do it. And I just encourage them to be a bit more inclusive in that sense. Thank you. Amanda, would you also like to comment on what you sort of see the role of men in the conversation as being? Yeah, look, I think it goes back to uh, respect and, and just, you know, all that we want, all that anyone wants to uh, uh, wants is actually to be treated with respect. And so I think we're not asking for any uh, special uh, treatment, but just fundamentally respect and that there's different ways of getting things done. So it goes back to uh, the comment that I made earlier about the most insightful observation that uh, anyone has said to me was a, you know, a male boss who was clearly frustrated by uh, the way that I got things done because he obviously couldn't uh, and hadn't during the time understood that it was an equally valid way of getting things done. So I think, yeah, just uh, men uh, having a, a broader mindset and um, on what is an acceptable way of getting something done in a timely manner. I think that would be really powerful because I think where clashes occur in culture, a lot of it goes back to that point. We do it this way here, <laughs> and uh, and um, and if they could, you know, if there could be more awareness that yeah, there are other ways. That would be what I would see. Thank you. And we have time for one more question. Uh, another student says that they're inspired by all of you in this conversation. Again, it's awesome to hear that. Um, Jill, I might throw this question to you. In your experience, what has been the most common unconscious bias that we need to tackle to get even more women and girls in science? I think um, it gets back to the gender stereotyping and, and just the idea that in the workplace, um, some workplaces struggle to be gender blind. I mean, just it builds on that last um, that last question and those answers uh, that we heard from Andrea and Amanda. I just think that people need to be seen for what they can do, treated with respect and um, and felt and made to feel comfortable. Um, about who they are and the way they go about it rather than having to fit in with some cultural norm or some way of looking or acting. And the more we can just allow people to, to focus on outcomes, what they can do and what they bring and, and embrace the diversity of workplaces, the more we'll get women in science. I, I do think that, that it's probably more the cultural barriers that um, make women feel uncomfortable than... Um, Really, because we're, we're very, a lot of us are very, you know, worried about how we feel or how we look or what they think or whatever, and that can sometimes play on our minds. And so just making sure people feel comfortable, included, respected is really uh, the way to break down the barriers, I think, and get women into, into roles. Thank you. Does anyone else want to make a brief comment? Otherwise, we'll move on. I I will. Yep. Um, we'll go to Manira and then we'll Misty. So I think one of uh, the things that I hear a lot uh, from women about is about the imposter syndrome, that they keep thinking it's the unconscious bias coming from the women themselves when they think they are not good enough for something, won't raise their hands when the opportunities would be in front of them. Something that I think we as women have to tackle ourselves, that uh, just I think Amanda was mentioning that if the men, they're 10% eligible for any position, they would think that they're good enough to go ahead. But even for a woman, they have to tick all the boxes before they make a decision to take on an opportunity. Uh, this is something, uh, it strikes you in, like you're not conscious of it sometimes, but not going ahead, not thinking you're good enough. This is something I have observed in quite a lot of women. Uh, this imposter syndrome, and uh, that's something that we ourselves have to address. Was it Misty that wanted to jump in? Oh, if I can. Yeah. 
just a quick look, comment. I think, I, look, I just think to wrap this up, I mean, you know, whether whether we like it or not, unconscious and conscious bias still exists in all of our workplaces, in science, outside of science, across this country and beyond. And we saw it play out in media this week with comments around the fact that women don't belong in the boardroom because they talk too much, for those of you who've been watching the news. So this is very real. I have had I have had men say to me, oh, you're not going to give that seminar with that bright red lipstick on and that those heels and that skirt, are you? Don't you want to be taken seriously as a scientist? Women aren't as intelligent as men. The, um, unfortunately, these, co- these comments are still very real and they are still happening. So let's not pretend that they don't. They are still there. And I think the conversation we need to have is what we need to do to tackle them. Um, and so that's probably a longer conversation for another time. Um, but... Um, but yeah, so I just I just wanted to say that I don't think it's necessarily about you know women fixing you know about fixing ourselves and it's you know we need more confidence and and we need to believe in ourselves and you know it's it's not about that we actually do have some really systemic cultural and structural barriers that still do exist that we that we really need to address. I mean I'm sure I'm not the only uh, woman in the in these Zoom boxes that's been talked over by a man in a in a meeting and, and cut off or had my scientific idea attributed to some to the man at the end of the table that that, you know, that repeated what I said and took the credit for it. This, this does happen. And so I think, you know, we need to be, um, we, need, we need to be speaking up, but we also need our, the culture to change around us and the men around us and the women around us and our leaders and our students and everyone to call it out. And so actually, oh, that Manira had that really great point. Or, yeah, I just want to back up what Andrea said there. And so, and, you know, to really be amplifying. So, you know, I just encourage all you girls uh, tuning in, you know, to amplify the voices of your of your sisters and your friends, um, you know, to be to have each other's backs. I think, as you know, as women, you know, that is it is a bit, it is tough. And I've talked about resilience, and we need to be helping each other up and standing up for those uh, in the back row behind us. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Misty. Unfortunately, that's all the time that we've got this morning. But what a huge morning it has been. Give well. If we could all be in a room, I'm sure there'd be thunderous applause, but I'll clap on everyone's behalf. And as the speaker said, you're all scientists now and and you can be leaders in STEM in the future. Um, As Misty said, it doesn't matter where you come from. And and as Amy said, you don't have to be getting all A's in science right now. You can still achieve incredible things. Um, And and a common theme and something that they've all said is, is that, you know, if we don't work, it, you, you don't have to work a day in your life if, if you love what you do. And it's a cliche, it's it's said a lot, but it's it's so, so true. So find what you love and find your support networks and mentors to guide you. And I'm sure you will all be brilliant. Thank you to everyone involved today. In particular, we thank our panelists, our speakers, and the students from Footscray High School and Galen Catholic College for submitting their video questions. Oh, here we all are as the Brady Bunch. Um, And as you've heard, the conversation regarding the importance of women and girls in science does not end with today's event. We encourage you to continue the discussion online with your friends and the wider community. Um, And this session has also been recorded and go back and rewatch it or share it. You can also use the hashtag Women's Science Day Vic and follow us on social media. And we'll have a slide at the end that has all of our social account details. And again, thank you for joining us for this very special celebration of the International Day of Women and Girls in Science. We need women and girls of all ages to pursue and flourish in a wide range of science-related careers. And we've heard from a lot of different careers here today. We need to connect with each other, support each other. And, you know, I've said we really need to be each other's cheerleaders. So thanks for an empowering and insightful morning and now continue your celebration of the International Day of Women and Girls in Science. Be inspired, be inquisitive, be brave and follow a path that is yours, whether it's in science, technology, engineering, mathematics or medicine.